so catching up on um, on the last days of, of talk, I think it has been mentioned uh, multiple times how to take a, a more risk-based approach also in the panel discussion uh, yesterday morning um, and, and, and throughout the presentations. And we're going to share uh, how we have been working with this uh, with some key players in the industry. Um, Mainly on the methodology, uh, but also how we've implemented software solutions to um, to help set out for for risk based asset management and and the approach uh, on that. Good. So just briefly about uh, Civit, we uh, are five years old, uh, and basically we step into collaboration with our partners in the industry based on you can see all the elements that's needed to, to do a digital shift. Uh, we do uh, enterprise grade uh, software solutions combined with uh, a solid industrial experience um, in the field of, of renewables and, and wind. And that's what we bring together. Um, we are located in Copenhagen uh, in Denmark, uh, Yerevan in Armenia and, and always in Denmark. Uh, as just said, we've been around for five years, crossed across so different different industries, but by far it's, it's energy where we do the most and a bit in, in medical devices as well. Um, and we, we now plus uh, 30 helpful minds ready to, to support um, our, our customers and, and the ones, yeah, we, we help. Good. Uh, so joining in here on, on asset management, what, what is it actually? I, I like this one that actually goes back from, from past 55. Uh, around it, it's a systematic and especially coordinated practice through which an organization optimally and sustainably manage assets. So there are really some things here around how do we coordinate business, how do we coordinate knowledge, and also how do we make sure to make the right decisions, not only strategically or tactically, but also operationally. And I think that's also when we talk about risk-based asset management, that is actually essence uh, of, of modern asset management, which is... Uh, it needs to be a process-driven uh, approach uh, based on information, where it's not just about making sure that we take decisions. We also need to set up the, some control points to, in order to do the right actions. And that has actually been a challenge if in, in, in how do we, with all that information we have available, um, take the right uh, actions? Because... Yeah, before we go on, um, maybe ne next time your boss come around, uh, that's definitely foundation needs to be set up. It, it, it's really great that, uh, that, that there's, there's an ask for, for an AI strategy, but, but in essence, it's about how do we manage knowledge and how do we manage information in the business uh, fundamentally so that we are able to do some more uh, fancy tools. That's at least the way we are approaching uh, the, the challenge we see in the industry. A few, a few more words on, on that challenge, and I've been part of it myself uh, in my past uh, on, on how we operate. I think many can recognize this, not to say everyone acts uh, like that, uh, but clearly I think many are still having some time-based maintenance plans that issue some actions that reports, uh, and then we go report on availability. Then over the years, we have added some, some surveillance alarms by, by some uh, control monitoring. And then more and more fancy stuff has come up. Uh, at least the way uh, I often see it is that, that we have uh, some taking uh, some SCADA signals, maybe some work orders, listen a bit to, to, to talk of town or maybe conferences uh, like this one, and then they put it into their magic board. And then we stand up and say, wow, see, it works. Uh, what I have found here, I can detect something. Let's go do. We do some actions. And um, then we, then others will come around and say, yeah, but, but I can also do some special inspections and I can put it in another magic ball and see uh, how it works. And it works. And then we go do some actions. Um, and then we could continue within uh, all different kind of special components in, in our different silos of bringing information into uh, a silo of a problem. And then we analyze that one in that context, uh, we demonstrate it works and we do some actions. Um, but is this really the way forward? Is it the way we make sure to make the 
to take the right actions. And, and I think that's the question that's going to be more and more evident and key um, as we, as we, um, yeah, as, as we progress as an industry and we get more and more insight and we get more and more opportunities and we get more and more of these uh, magic balls here and magic wands uh, where, where we can, can do stuff and get, get more information with us home. And the question is really, are we, uh, is it waste of money, some of the actions we're taking? Because there's so many things we observe, there's so many things we see, uh, and how do we actually make sure to make the right, uh, to take the right actions in order to, to spend our money correctly? So so how, how should we maybe think, uh, and the way we are thinking, is actually to say, it, it's great that we have surveillance alarms. It's, ba it's okay that we have still time-based maintenance plans. We still have all our magic balls. But at the end of the day, we need to make sure we detect some technical known phenomena. And if they don't know, let's, uh, let's index them. Because the same thing could be observed from the surveillance alarms, as well as uh, from one of our magic balls or one of the other channels where we detect things. At the end of the day, it has to go in. And what we are finding is a technical risk. It's a phenomenon. Um, that could occur. And based on that, we need to figure and be more concrete around what are our actual mitigation options when that one occurs, no matter how we detected it. Then we go do some actions based on these mitigations. And then what is really interesting is actually to what degree are we actually able to reduce the occurrences of these risks uh, that we know of. So we start get a, a learning approach uh, to that. Uh, we call it risks. You could also call it technical phenomena. You could call it uh, things that could happen uh, to your asset that we know of and that we have specified. And that's of course great when we look at it from a, such an overall approach here. But how? But how should we actually work with it? And when are we to take a mitigating action? Yeah, that we are to do when there is a, a risk um, that is uh, sufficiently uh, critical. But how do we evaluate that? Yeah, <clears throat> next step here is maybe a bit of a, a, a busy uh, slide. I'm, I'm going to try to, to build it up because we do have all this information here sitting around. We have scalar signals, work orders, inspections, special inspections, deviation registrations, image material drawings. And we could classify them in different ways. It's not only scalar signals, it's also other signals. And we also have talk, and tower, talk of town, and which is also important information. And how do we basically structure that? As we just saw, often we have a tendency to bring it together within the context of uh, the model we are trying to, to, to solve or, or the discipline, the, the, the activity we are trying to do. Some of these activities could be yeah, risk identification. It could be event forecasting. So how often is this to happen? It could be impact analysis to be how costly is this? If this, yeah, so, so, so yeah, it could be our surveillance. It could be uh, how do we more optimally respond to when we see some things, try and analyze the data. Could we change the inspection order? Um, and also, as we talk a lot about uh, uh, abnormality detections, which is often perceived to be this uh, magic ball. But we are basically cross intersecting all this information with all the types of analysis we can do. Um, in many often in a context without structuring it, it, it for business purpose. And the way we approach it is that there are two very, very key elements that needs to be in place. It's your asset representation, because only by having that in a versatile, homogeneous and simple way, you're able to associate all that information into your asset structure and knowing what this information is talking about so that we can use it inside the different analysis types. And the other thing that needs to be in place is that risk registry that I talked about, where we actually are storing our analysis results, the population of assets that's affected by this one, and also the mitigations that we can take uh, if we detect anomaly related to this risk. Because only by having the bottom piece and the top piece here in place, we're able to actually structure all our analysis results as well as all our information in a meaningful way that can be used uh, across. And of course, 
it would also be nice to know what objectives are, are we actually trying to solve uh, because that's the way we should identify the risks. Because do, do we get that in place? Yeah, then we can start set up some action controllers and only by these controllers we issue action. So even though we detect something, yeah, that's fine, but the risk is not critical enough because our event forecast um, is, is yet not saying that this has a high enough likelihood or for that matter our impact is, is sufficiently low. So even though we detect it, yeah, let's not do, do an action and spend the money. But if we act this way, yeah, then we are clearly getting an opportunity to also control our action, control our cost. And by that, the time-based maintenance plans can also rule out because it's, it will always be subject to our impact analysis, our event forecast, when we should go do something uh, around uh, this risk, which could be loose balls or low, loose balls on the, on the tower, for instance. So in other words, this will start to govern no risk, no action, no cost. And, and that's the only way we can start to get in control with, with the cost that we spend. Do we have these information in place? We also get other benefits. Uh, then we can just start to stack the forecasts and then we can also start to see what should we expect of the future. And this is not new, uh, so to say, to, to our industry. Um, there are a lot of guidance, a lot of disciplines around how these things can be performed. Uh, if we look into to standards, especially on asset representation on an asset, and on risk registers and risk management, as well as on, on the overall objective setting in terms of, of asset management. And this is not wind specific, it's not renewable specific, it's across industry uh, practices. And if you just go follow these guidelines, then we can actually make it quite practical. So maybe a bottom line here is, we need to get a risk register in place as a knowledge structure for the company, as well as an asset representation in place, that is basically our accounting structure of all this information we have here. Otherwise, we keep funneling around here in the middle without controlling uh, what actions we are taking in a, across the company. To put it maybe a bit uh, simple, you can also say that the bottom part is about uh, asset information management. Here we need to take an asset information or an information management approach um, and the other part is, is knowledge management. Um, to, put, to zoom in a bit on the top one, actually we have been around uh, now with uh, key players in the company and, and has also developed uh, software where we actually are capable of managing a, a risk register where we can classify uh, the risks. There are a lot of risk management tools out there that can do that. But what is uh, on top of this is that we have uh, the opportunity to configure different analysis techniques to capture these results. So whether we've done a very basic uh, likelihood impact analysis of this risk, we store it and maintain it there. We, the results of the viable analysis and also the event uh, cost impact as an, as an example. All these different techniques, we can store the results of so that we are able to stack our information. Um, we can across all the asset information we have, clearly set up queries to say, this risk of icing of the blade is uh, relevant for all turbines of this kind and that kind and this kind uh, placed in the Northern hemisphere. Uh, yeah, or so, so, so many miles above, I don't know, some kind of place. Um, we are also capable of linking the, the risks into the RDS function. So we can afterwards go and look the other way around and say, when we have an RDS function, uh, what are now the risks that applies to, let's say, what do we know of all the risk on, on the planetary stage uh, or the first planetary stage of the gearboxes? Here you see all the risks associated. So the next time we have to go and take an investment or plan our cost, yeah, most probably this is, um, this is the, 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 what we should expect, or at least what we know we should expect. We can set up monitors and also action controllers to actually issue work orders based on these risks. And then there's a long list of information that we, that we are able to, to link into these risks, whether it's being the deviations, the monitors, the standard works for mitigations and documents and drawings. And not least, and very important for this in a cross-organizational manner, with a full audit log, with an enterprise-grade access control, 
and also with the change uh, request process to update the risk information. So you could still have people suggesting updates, the analyst suggests an update, but it's the technical authority that at the end of the day approves, yes, now we go with this viable curve instead. That could also be, be that's not necessarily needed to run uh, in that way. A few more screenshots from it, uh, pulling in the actual findings, the actual information, examples of the risk, uh, places where we have seen it. Um, Example of how we can structure multiple uh, assessment results, in this case, an FMEGA result, and, and some of the data that's used to, to pull it in. This is just one module uh, out of a bigger thing in Asset Integrity Hub, which we provide, which is a, a fully partitioned application stack uh, ready to use. Uh, it's built up around a, a partition information management approach, where both we manage all the underlying information uh, we saw before uh, in the bottom, as well as now we have built this whole business knowledge management module uh, on top as, as a risk management module to, to, to host it. So covering both uh, places. Yeah, so to summarize, um, to take a risk-based approach is the key to make the right actions. That's at least what we believe. Uh, if we don't, we, we're still going to, to just act on uh, what we see out there. Um, and, and without considering what is actually the most important to my overall objectives and, and the likelihood that are latest evaluated. Um, there's surely a lot to learn from other industries when it comes to these practices. Not so much around the, the magic balls uh, or the domain expertise on the specific uh, technical matters in the wind industry, but when it comes to how to structure all the knowledge we have as well as structuring all the information we have on an asset structure that clearly um, exist already. Um, and lastly, yeah, there is solutions now out there that exist. We have made one uh, and right now we're implementing it by, by key players uh, of the industry where we actually starting to say, how do we bring together a proper asset registry where we link the information to and then on top of that having a, a knowledge management setup where we're capable of saying every time we do a new analysis of, of a technical phenomenon, gearbox failures, um, the viable, curve, viable parameters of that, let's store them so we can use them for multiple things. Um, let's agree on what are the mitigation actions we have to this, and also in what order are we accessing them. When we're doing a, 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 a piece of, when we, when we do a, a standard work, what is the optimized sequence? which is the best way to approach it. We store it there. So basically, we still do all the analysis, but now we actually get a place to, to manage uh, all, all that knowledge um, in, in a solution that also ties back into the asset registry. Yeah. That's great. So a bit of a case study on how we've actually approached this on, on key players uh, within the industry and, and the software tools we put in place to manage it. Great. Um, I'm not seeing any questions yet, so I, I'll uh, I'll ask some of mine um, because it has prompted uh, a few. So, um, like we were talking about earlier this morning in the panel, um, the different industries and sort of maturity levels. Um, I believe you are working. Your company is working with non-wind clients. Do, do you have any insights there about uh, about best practices or, or learnings or, or is this type of thing commonly and well done in other industries and still relatively new with wind actors? I think in more regulated industries, which we're also in like the, the medical device industry, it, it's not a question of, of if you want or not. You have to have a documented uh, risk management approach uh, to your assets and your designs. Otherwise, you're simply not able, uh, allowed to operate and, and provide these uh, devices uh, to the market with the players that, that we are with. So, so of course, it's such an embedded and rude practice to say we need to have a, a knowledge place where we are structuring these things into. You also to sign uh, personally uh, when you're updating uh, these information as the authority to say, yes, it's okay that we don't do this action or we have to go this action, and these are the response plans, uh, so to say, um, 
uh, to the different technical issues we have or phenomenons, risks that we have identified. So it's not really a question, uh, Patrick, if, if, if needed or not in, in such industry. Okay. And I, I think in our industry, there's there's so much focus on SCADA data and operational data. And, and you know, we just need to, that, that's sort of number one. It's like, if we can just collect and store all of that, then, you know, that's, that's the battle is mostly won. Um, but you're advocating something fairly different here that, um, what I'm wondering is, is how, how much is SCADA data factoring into your platform or is, is it like the, the foundation factors. or is it a part it, or is it not really that, uh, that critical? It, it factors a lot, I think, uh, but instead of, we, we have had a tendency to, um, to, to actually say, okay, which, which issues uh, happens the most? Let's set up a Pareto uh, of, of the alarms that happens the most and then uh, find a way uh, to manage that. And I think it, it's also partly the right solution. But there's also other risks that we don't see that has not yet occurred. And the question is really, how do we as a company, as an organization, get an indexation of what are the things that could happen? Let's do an evaluation of the criticality of these things and then say, okay, the ones with the highest criticality, even though they have not yet occurred also, where should we start mitigate by let's putting uh, proactive monitors in place? Okay, it requires these data information. Good, let's get those in place and let's capture that more information uh, because of that, that risk. So it actually also implicitly, or actually quite explicitly, becomes a prioritization of um, what are the monitors with what SCADA data we need to get in place to get in control of our business. Uh, so it plays a lot in, it's, it's a key information source as well as other information sources as well. But but instead of only uh, looking into the information we have available, we should maybe rather start from what are the risks that we know could occur and then look at what are the best source uh, to mitigate uh, that risk and then go structure these information. Okay. And what typically is the, what are the responses from wind asset managers when you are introducing or, or pitching this type of thing um, to them? Um, or is it, is it more, I mean, I would imagine that this is useful sort of top to bottom from an organization, but especially at the, the top level for risk management, those big and costly decisions and investments and things like that. But how about asset managers and their sort of day to day uh, work? And work? Yeah, I actually operating with a set of asset managers because it, it, it's exactly about making it operational, right? Uh, it, it's no different than saying, okay, I need to do my cost forecast for next year. What should I expect? Okay, what are the what are the technical phenomena I take in? And then you do that as a one-off exercise to go, okay, what should we expect of how many gearbox failures, et cetera, et cetera, instead of having a just an institutionalized process for how to continuously update these numbers, which will also automatically give me a, a forecasted, uh, an updated forecast on, on, on these numbers as an asset manager. Um, so even uh, 30, 50 people organizations, as soon as you start get more people and people are also sometimes leaving the company. How do I actually start to institutionalize this information that we have rather than being so dependent on individuals? Yeah, that the only way to go about that is to start do some knowledge management. And that's basically what it is. We would call it risk, we would call it something else, but it's actually to combine the knowledge set and to combine the results of all the analysis that we do uh, towards uh, some, some some targeted phenomena, we call them risks, you could call them something else, but that's actually what it's about. Um, so of course, how do people approach it? Yeah, you could approach it with, okay, um, am I then important any longer, me as a, as a blade or gearbox specialist, because I was the one sitting with the knowledge of that one. Uh, you could also approach it with the, with the approach, okay, if I actually institutionalize it, I can get a much wider reach of my knowledge in this company, because I can automatically make it available uh, to all the different sites that has these components to actually go see what are our response actions to these and those uh, typical failures. And I'll typically also get a faster response because the information is available up front for, for engineering. Yeah, and especially for, for forecasting. A lot of times it's sort of like, okay, it's time to do a forecast. So I, I stop my work and I 
I launch that project and assemble information and, and do that and, and want to want it to be want it to be done with and, and over with quickly. But if exactly. you have this in, in a system or in a platform, then the forecasting chore is is really much more minimized. Exactly. And the key to this is not to make it a risk management software that sits up there in a risk management department where I have to type in numbers again. The, the key to this is to actually make it in a way that I'm capable of funneling in my findings. So basically, all the analysis I'm anyway doing, how do I store the results in a continuous way in a, in a common registry? So, so that I'm actually able to use them across, whether it is to issue actions or it is to, to make your forecast, as you say, because it is pulling on the same uh, analysis results uh, for, for both to understand both criticality within the next weeks, but also criticality in terms of should I get the parts in place in my, in my inventory. Okay. Well, great. Uh, we're just about out of time. So uh, very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, really good presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks for the time. All right. Thanks a lot. And we'll jump to the next session.